Thank you. You're going to hear me. I guarantee it. <laughs> if you're wondering who I spoke to in Antarctica, let me just say all the penguins were in formal dress, so you look rather <laughs> drab in comparison. I'm delighted to be here to speak on Andy Griffith. I had to look in my notes. When was the first time I spoke at this library in Goldsboro? It was all the way back 26 years ago. I had forgotten about that. In 1992, I came here. I was sponsored by Duke University because in 1992, that happened to be the 500th anniversary of Columbus coming over here in 1492. And Duke being Duke, they got a huge grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities to hire a Duke history professor to dress up as Christopher Columbus and go to libraries all over the state to talk as if he were Columbus. Well, of course, no self-respecting Duke history professor was going to dress up like Christopher Columbus, so they came over to NC State and got me. I was thrilled to do it. <laughs> Went all over the state. Not only did they get money for me to be Columbus, they had money to have a statewide essay contest, only open to North Carolina students in the fourth grade, 10 year olds. They had to write an essay on the significance of Columbus Day. I was one of the judges, even though I wasn't Duke faculty, but because I was dressed up as Columbus, they let me judge. I mention this because the little girl, I thought, should have won first place. It was just a paragraph essay, because these are only 10 year olds, her essay, I thought, was spectacular. She didn't get first place. She didn't get last place. She got a dishonorable mention for her little essay. And when I was looking, when I was here last, in the folder, there was the essay from this little girl who wrote about the significance of Columbus Day. And I decided, before I turned to Andy Griffith, I want to read you this paragraph essay she wrote. And you'll see she was robbed. This is what she wrote on the significance of Columbus Day. Columbus Day is very important to us. Columbus Day must never be forgotten. We celebrate a man who was so friendly that he asked everybody to call him Columbus rather than Mr. Day. <laughs> now, I was a little confused, but terribly original, and I thought she got robbed. Anyway, moving on to Christopher Columbus, <laughs> oh no, from Christopher Columbus to Andy Griffith, you may be thinking, why would this man talk to us in Goldsboro, the place where Andy Griffith had his first job and stayed three years? This guy's going to tell us about Andy Griffith. It is true. I am a fast-talking Yankee professor, and I'm supposedly supposed to talk on a slow-talking Southern sheriff but I have my creds. I have done my homework. I deserve to speak on Andy Griffith. Just this afternoon, coming down from Raleigh, I kept saying to myself so I could say to you before I started, Shazam! <laughs> Golly! Now, if that doesn't give me creds, nothing will do. But I am a professor. I have done my research, so let me tell you a few things about not a native to this town, but a man who certainly enjoyed living here that you may not know. First of all, we have to get him born. He was born on June 1st, 1926. I mention this because Andy could have been in the audience. He would be 92, but he'd only be 92 today. I think all of us know 92-year-olds today who are certainly more than capable of coming to a library and enjoying a performance. He was born in 1926. What you need to know, and he would want you to know, he was from the working class. Absolutely blue-collar class. The first way we know it is his name. There is no such thing as Andrew Griffith. It was, excuse, <clears throat> it was Andy. And back then, to name a child with a nicknamey name like Andy, usually from blue collar, for sure. The other thing, though his father, as you will hear, made chairs and worked at a furniture, uh, he was a very good a craftsman, a, a furniture making company. Andy had no crib. 
They didn't have a lot of money. They had a chest of drawers next to the bed, of course. They simply opened the very first one, put him in there, and that's where he slept when he was born. As Andy Griffith liked to say, I was top drawer from the beginning, which he certainly was. You also probably didn't know, because I had to research this, he was born with a strawberry birthmark on the back of his head. His mother was very proud of this. She claims the reason he had a strawberry birthmark was because the day before he was born, and keep in mind, he was born on June 1st, the last day of May when she felt labor pains, she was in a strawberry patch in Mount Airy picking strawberries. You know, pick your own like we do today. So she was convinced. But I wouldn't mention this except this strawberry patch comes in very important early in his life. When he would go to elementary school in Mount Airy, and of course you walk there, there was a prescribed path his parents told him to take. In fact, the strawberry patch where his mother had been picking strawberries the day before he was born was right on the way, but she, they made it very clear, you don't go through that because the man who owned the property was mean and did not like trespassers. Andy was not a young man who used to get in trouble a lot, but as a little boy, because he was inevitably late going to school, it was much quicker to cut across that. So his mother caught him going across that strawberry patch, and he was about nine years old. She said to him, Andy, you know you don't go through that strawberry patch, even if it's quicker. And at age nine, he looked up at his mother and said, but you know how much I love a strawberry shortcut. <laughs> now that is pretty clever wordplay for a nine-year-old little boy, and it tells us even at a very early age, he had a facility for making people laugh. He was never a joke teller, as you know. He's a storyteller, and it seems to have started back then. His childhood was not idyllic. Think of his birth year, 1926. What was going on when he was three, four, five, six, seven, eight? It was the depth of the depression. This is what Andy Griffith tells us about his childhood. Quote, I wasn't smart, my father wasn't wealthy, and I wasn't athletic. And in a little town like Mount Airy, if you're not rich, and you're not smart, and you're not an athlete, then you really aren't much of anything. As you can tell from that, he was bullied at first. He was really little and scrawny, though he certainly grew up to be a big man, very little and scrawny, but the bullying stopped when he figured out that he wasn't an athlete enough to fight these people, but he had verbal skills to make fun, not of the bully, but of himself. And the kids would laugh, and he understood in the laughter that he occasioned by his verbal wit, there was strength there, and the bullies didn't bother him after that. He was not a good student uh, in elementary, even in high school, but he knew what he wanted to be fairly early on because at age 15, he went to a Bing Crosby movie called Birth of the Blues. And in the movie, for the first time, he actually saw a band, a, I can't believe I forgot, the, what he, not a big band, but a, what kind of, you know, uh, Glenn Miller they are? So, uh, not swing band, but big, big is it a big band? That doesn't sound right. Big bands, that's plural, that's the problem. He finally saw big bands that he'd heard about, but what was in that movie that drew his attention was a man playing a shiny slide trombone. He had to have one. He saw a used one in the Spiegel catalog. He saved up money by, as an elementary student and then junior high, sweeping the Mount Airy High School every day before school and after school till he finally could afford the used slide trombone. He bought it. It came to his house. He said he gazed at it every day. He polished it every other day. He did everything you could possibly do with it except play it, because he had no idea how you play a slide trombone. And he didn't know anybody who knew how to teach him until somebody told him that there was a Moravian minister named Ed Mickey a few miles outside of Mount Airy. 
So 15 year old, excuse me, 14 year old Andy Griffith, no 15, goes to Ed Mickey and tells him his dream is to be in a big band and to play the slide trombone and he has one. Why he did this we don't know, but Ed Mickey told him that he would give him weekly lessons for three years and not charge him anything. He saw something in Andy Griffith that was different than most young uh, men and knew he was committed. And so for three years, once a week, and it wasn't that Ed Mickey had a whole lot of money as a Moravian minister, but his good deed was to teach him for three years. I emphasize this, and I don't think more than it should be, because to me, it leads to the Andy Griffith show and Mayberry more than anything else in his life. Because Ed Mickey was a giver. What he wanted to do was make other people's lives easier by doing what he could for them. And to me, what unites all characters on the Andy Griffith show, all of them, and all the plots as well, I'm talking about Andy, Gomer, Goober, Thelma Lou, Aunt B, even Barney, all of them were helpers. They looked to other people, and whether they bungled it or not, their mission was to help somebody else. That's the theme of the show, and it goes back to Ed Mickey. He graduates in the class of 1944 from Mount Airy High, and he goes on, as you all know, to Chapel Hill as a pre-ministerial student. If I would tell you that he was a bad student at Chapel Hill, it doesn't even begin to indicate how awful he was. I mean, he was terrible. As he said, he's the only person he knew of in the history of Chapel Hill to flunk poli sci twice. Same course, same man. Awful. You know, I hope some of you are old enough to remember the famous commercial that Andy Griffith did for Ritz crackers. It was a very simple commercial. He just eats a Ritz cracker and he says, good cracker, good cracker. I mention this because Andy Griffith wasn't a bad student. He was a bad, <laughs> bad student. How bad was he? He had to get out of pre-ministerial and into a music major. He did like music, but what he liked best about music was that if you're a music major at Chapel Hill, no foreign language, no math, no chemistry. So he gets into music to try and graduate, which he will do. The minute he gets into music, it opens all sorts of doors to him. The next semester, the other music majors come up and excitedly tell him that for the first time, they're gonna be doing Gilbert and Sullivan in a production that spring. And Andy was excited, but a bit confused. He didn't come from a cultural background, so he asked one of the other students, he said, do you think I should try out for Gilbert or Sullivan? Well, he kind of missed the boat, but he got in the, this, this light musical, and it is here he meets a very attractive and incredibly talented young woman with the odd name of Bobby, obviously it was Rebecca, Bobby Edwards. They meet. Three days later, he proposes to her. She makes him wait three years, but he will marry Bobby Edwards. Both of them are music majors, but she is brilliant in singing and dancing. And he's not really brilliant in much of anything. But for seven years, the two of them go out to Manteo to be in the Lost Colony. Undergraduate and beyond, they are in the Lost Colony. But you need to know, at this point in his life, and for a while after they're married, he is not the star. Bobby is the star. She will be known, she feels, as a great dancer or as a great singer, and Andy will be the happy husband. She was Queen Elizabeth in the Lost Colony production, and she got all the rave reviews. He finally worked himself up to be Sir Walter Raleigh, but during the first month of the performance, he heard two older women in the first uh, row when he came on stage say, what spindly legs Sir Walter Raleigh has. So the next day he got a bunch of newspapers and stuffed them up his tights so that he could look the part of Sir Walter Raleigh. Well, you should know what happens next. They graduate and they're not gonna make it on Broadway right away, so second best, they come to Goldsboro, North Carolina, 
and decide to stay here and earn money for the first time. You all know, I assume you do, that Andy was hired as an assistant drama coach, but in charge of the glee club and the choir and teaching drama as well. So he's here. His wife gets a very good job at the church. I think it's the Methodist church, but I can't swear to it. I'm sure some of you know as a choir director and works there. He was not a great teacher. He knew teaching was not the thing that he was called for. He tells the wonderful story of the very first semester he taught there was a young sophomore in his class named Craig. He not only was in that class, he was in all three classes that Andy taught, and he always took the first seat right under Andy's nose up front. He always <laughs> fell asleep when the class would start and wouldn't wake up until the end. And so early on in that first week, Andy looked at Craig and said, Craig, you know you can't sleep in my class. And he claimed that Craig looked up to him and said, no, Mr. Griffith, I know I can't, but if you were just a little quieter, I think I'd be able to. <laughs> this was depressing to him. After three years, he and Bobby leave Goldsboro with $300 that had been in their teacher retirement fund and decide they're going to make it in show business in North Carolina. They move to Chapel Hill. They create a show where she will dance and she will sing, and Andy will play the guitar to accompany her and do a few songs. They will go to every Rotary, Kiwanis, every club that might need them. Charge $10, $15, see what would happen. They get along very well. People love them a lot. They have all sorts of contacts. They're going all over, mostly the central and eastern part of the state, but even in the mountains. But Andy knows that he's not that good on the guitar. What he's really good with is telling stories. Never a joke, uh, joke teller, but a storyteller. And so for this show, to try and compete with his talented wife, he can't do it musically, so he invents a country preacher, what is known as a deacon, Deacon Jones. And he entertains the crowd by giving these rabble-rousing sermons that Deacon Jones gives. He's a wonderful preacher, but he's never been anywhere outside of Hushpuckany, North Carolina. He's naive, he doesn't know the world, but boy, can he preach. And the people eat it up. We don't know if we ever would have heard from Andy Griffith, except finally, after a year, a Rotary Club booked them for the second time, which meant he couldn't give the same sermon that he'd been doing all over the state. He had to come up with a new thing for Deacon Jones, and it had to come up quick. It's this naive man who knows nothing about the world. Andy wasn't sure what the topic would be, but he learned early on when he was bullied that if you want to overcome your fears, your worst fears, you do it with humor. Well, the thing that humiliated Andy as an elementary student more than anything else, he was put on the football team, and he was just awful because he was too young. I mean, he was too thin and scraggly. And so when it comes time for him to think about what Deacon Jones could talk about, he decides he's going to overcome his fear of football by making Deacon Jones go to something that Deacon Jones has no idea what it is. But what it was, was football. That's why he created what it was, was football. It was a smash hit immediately. And finally, in 1953, the Jefferson Pilot Life Insurance Company in Greensboro has him do it at their state convention, which meant everything got taped. Like I'm being taped tonight, maybe there's hope for me yet, making it big. He was 23, I'm 90, so probably not. But anyway, they taped it. And Andy took the tape to Chapel Hill where they had a record-making machine. And so Andy Griffith decides he's going to make a record of what it was was football and distribute it all over the state. Well, they inform him, you can't make a record of what it was was football because there's two sides, and it's not long enough for part A and part B. So the A side was what it was was football, but he had to come up with something that was the B side. Well, he remembered, if you want to overcome your awful fears, 
do it with humor. He almost didn't graduate his senior year because his English teacher flunked him because he couldn't pass the test on Romeo and Juliet. And so for the B-side, he decides, what would it be like for a country bumpkin to try to describe the story of Romeo and Juliet? And it is a, I don't know if you've ever heard it. I know you know what it was with football. Well, Romeo and Juliet is almost just as good. Well, there it is. But he would, shouldn't have gone anywhere, except there was a man who worked for Capitol Records in New Jersey, who every week checked the market for regional records to see if there might be some record in Arizona or North Carolina that sold way more than anything else and they might discover new talent outside of New York and New Jersey. And sure enough, the number one recording outside of the big markets that year was Andy Griffiths, what it was was football. The agent listens to it, his name is Richard Link, he will be Andy's agent for the rest of his life. He goes down to North Carolina and tells Bobby and Andy they will never make it big here. He is not only asking them to move up to Manhattan, but then he will book them on all the important venues. So the two of them now see fame in their future. As they're going up to New York, his wife Bobby turns to him and says, you know, my biggest challenge is gonna be getting rid of this Southern accent. And Andy Griffith, who knows what he's good at and what made his famous, he said, my biggest challenge is gonna be keeping my Southern accent. And he got that just right. Bobby lost her Southern accent and never went anywhere. Nobody was interested in her dance or song because there's a million beautiful young women in New York who could do it as well or better. But nobody had seen what Andy Griffith did. He goes on Ed Sullivan three months after he arrives and bombs entirely because that kind of audience was not for him. But his agent said, don't worry, I'm going to book you as the opening act for famous people who are in nightclubs all over Manhattan. Within three months, he is the opening act for Mae West, if you can imagine. Mae West, opened by Andy Griffith. He lasted three nights and she fired him. When he came home disgruntled, his wife Bobby said, weren't you funny? He said, no, that wasn't the problem. I was too funny. They loved Andy Griffith and Mae West, that was a hard act to follow after him. So, we don't know what would have happened to him because he's just struggling as a nightclub performer and a man you never heard of named Mac Hyman wrote a play called No Time for Sergeants that they decided to put on Broadway. Well, the leading man in No Time for Sergeants was a Southern hick named Will Stockdale had a thick Southern accent, and people had seen Andy Griffith. And even up north, his record of what it was was football was very famous for, I mean, given that it was a, a, a regional record. And they tried him out for it, and he wins the star part in No Time for Sergeants. It went on Broadway for 800 performances. His co-star was Roddy McDowell, who was a big name for years with Elizabeth Taylor. I mean, this is unheard of. A guy from North Carolina, Goldsboro in particular, a few years before, now doing 800 performances. And they loved him. But like everybody else, if you do 800 performances on Broadway, you can't be good every night. But Andy Griffith was a perfectionist from the day he was born till the day he died. And a minor actor in No Time for Sergeants, tell you how minor this actor was, he played the role of corp Corporal Manual Dexterity, because the whole thing is in the army. This no-count little actor who was playing Manual Dexterity would see Andy Griffith after a performance, beat his fist on the set because he didn't wow the audience that he had the last night. And so this actor came up to him and he says, well, you know, you can't do it every night, Andy. And Andy looked at him and said, well, I can damn well try. That name of that obscure actor who played manual dexterity was Don Knotts. It is the one and only time they will be together before the Andy Griffith show. But he didn't forget about him. 800 performances, he's not even 30, and Elia Kazan, probably the most important director of movies of the age, 
sees him and had just been given a movie script for something called A Face in the Crowd, with the main character being Lonesome Rhodes, a charismatic, evil televangelist type, completely opposite of what Andy Griffith had ever played. But Elia Kazan thinks casting against type would work, but he figures there's no way Andy Griffith can stretch that far. But he invites him to audition by himself in a restaurant after the restaurant closed at night. And Andy Griffith wants this part because Elia Kazan was an enormous director. And before he goes into the room, he asks Elia Kazan, do you happen to know who Oral Roberts is? And Elia Kazan had never heard of Oral Roberts, but most people in the Midwest and South knew who Oral Roberts was, this televangelist. And so Andy Griffith imitated what he remembered of the Oral Roberts healing shows on television and radio and was so brilliant and Ilya Kazan didn't have a clue he was actually doing somebody else that he was hired on the spot. He was robbed of getting an Academy Award. That's how good this thing was. So he's not quite 30, 800 performances on Broadway, a leading man in an Ilya Kazan show. Nothing it seems like could stop him, but he's wrong because A Face in the Crowd went so well, they immediately put him in his next movie called Onion Head, which was shown to probably 84 people in the nation. Complete and utter dud. He fails miserably in the movies, and he's not gonna try again. So they put him in a musical, a Broadway musical called Destry Rides Again. He goes in, three weeks later, they're advertising at the box office, three for one tickets, buy one, take three of your friends. So that closes on him. And now at age 30, he's had a huge success on Broadway and a disaster, and a huge success in movies and a disaster. And he knows one more disaster in movies or in Broadway, it won't be a fluke, it'll be a trend, and it'll be over. Many people flash for a minute when they're late 20s and then die. And so his brilliant agent, Richard Link, asks him to do something that Andy would have never done on his own. He said, there's only one medium you haven't tried, and that's television. Nobody who's been on Broadway for 800 performances and leading in a movie by Elia Kazan wants to go down in 1959 to television, but he has no choice. Fortunately, the reason Andy went along with it is that his agent knew the single greatest producer of television situation comedies then and in the history of television. There was a man back then by the name of Sheldon Leonard. Sheldon Leonard had been an actor, but then invented one smash television hit after another in the 50s. His biggest was going on right then, the Danny Thomas show or Make Room for Daddy. Sheldon Leonard could do no wrong with situation comedies. He was so great that in 2007, long after he was dead and forgotten, two men created a television show, a situation comedy you might have heard of. And to honor the memory of Sheldon Leonard, they decided to call the two main actor characters in their comedy, Sheldon and Leonard. And of course it is the Big Bang Theory and it is all dedicated to this man who would be the making of Andy Griffith. So Sheldon Leonard looks at Andy Griffith, sees what he's done, knows what it was was football and says, I've got a fail-proof thing for you. There's gonna be a little southern no-place town and you're gonna be the big man, big shot in the town. You not only will be the sheriff of the town and wear a badge, but because then you're the justice of the peace, you'll have to rip off the badge and put on the black robe. But because you're the newspaper editor of the little town as well, you're gonna have to rip off the robe and put on the green visor. And he said, Andy, what do you think? And Andy, of course, said, too much taken off and putting on costumes. And it's Andy who said, too complex and gimmicky. He said, let's stick with just one role. The one I think I know best is a Southern sheriff. I'll call myself Andy Taylor. Well, they decide to do a pilot. I guarantee it wouldn't have gone anywhere because most pilots starring people like Andy Griffith, 
who was known on Broadway and a sophisticated movie, people would have never tuned in in enough numbers to keep it going after the pilot. But the genius of Sheldon Leonard was, he said, we'll get 12 million people to watch your pilot. Impossible, says uh, Andy and Richard Link. <coughs> no, he said, because what I'm going to do on the Danny Thomas show in a month, Danny is going to drive through a podunk little southern town and he's going to get a ticket for going through the one stoplight in town and it's going to be given to him by Sheriff Andy Taylor. We will introduce this whole new character on a show that's already number one in the nation. Sheldon Leonard said, I'm going to call it a spin-off. Maybe it'll have wheels. Well, needless to say, I can't tell you how many spin-offs there have been on television since then. But this is the first, and it guaranteed there'd be two billion people watching this unknown Andy Griffith. It was a very funny episode. So many people saw it that they said the Andy Griffith show will go into production in the fall. And he's ready to go, and now all he has to do is come up with the other characters and get some scripts written. Right after the pilot aired in the spring of the fall of when it was going to become a show, he gets a call from a man he hadn't thought about in years, Don Knotts, who had watched the pilot. And Andy said, what do you think? And Don Knotts says, I have one question. Doesn't Sheriff Taylor need a deputy? <laughs> Don Knotts had just been fired from the Steve Allen show and was out of work. Saw his old friend, or at least his uh, castmate there. He came up with the idea of Barney Fife and so it goes into production. The first episode of The Andy Griffith Show, remember the first one was a pilot on The Danny Thomas Show, aired on October 3rd, 1960. He was in it for eight solid years, which is impressive, but more impressive is this. Within three weeks, The Andy Griffith Show cracked the top 10 shows in the nation for the week. After only three weeks, it was in the top 10. That is impressive, but what is far more impressive is this. It hit the top 10 after only three weeks. It stayed in the top 10 for all eight years. Once it became number four in week three, it never fell below the 10th most watched show in its entire run. But far more impressive than any of this, after eight years, they ended it when the Andy Griffith Show was the number one show in the nation for the whole year. They got out at the top rather than doing which what most shows will always do. Get the money by milking this show long after the public has lost interest, long after the actors are bored, long after the audience isn't there. The Andy Griffith Show, he decided to give it all up and they went out as number one. There are only three shows in television history that decided to stop when they were number one. The other two won't surprise you. The Andy Griffith Show, I Love Lucy went out at number one, and Seinfeld went out at number one. But the difference between The Lucy Show and I Love Lucy and Andy Griffith and um, Seinfeld, as great as those two other shows were, and as how impressive it is they went out. They're out. You can see them anywhere in the world today on some station, but no minister ever wrote a sermon about I Love Lucy or Seinfeld. As far as we know, there are over 10,000 ministers who have based a Sunday sermon on something taken from the Andy Griffith Show. It not only was number one, but it taught us something from the heart that most situation comedies would never do. When they began filming, you won't be surprised to know the very first scene they filmed of the Andy Griffith Show. It is, of course, the opening where they introduce who's on it. It is one of the most famous openings when Andy and Opie are walking down that uh, path up to the fishing hole, and we all remember Opie throwing that little stone in there. Well, they ask a man named Earl Hagen to come up with the theme song for the Andy Griffith Show, and they told him this is terribly important. We need something that will say Andy Griffith Show. 
He got so upset by trying to create just the perfect thing that he had a mental block until Andy himself went up to him and said, don't worry about anything complex. I want you to write something so simple that people can whistle it. And that's all it took. He said he created the theme song to the Andy Griffith Show thinking about something people could whistle. He went into the recording studio the next Monday and he whistled the theme to the Andy Griffith Show. But what is amazing is he said he never had whistled before. He never whistled <laughs> afterwards. But that whistle is in all of our minds and will be there forever. And the other thing you need to know about that opening scene, Opie was five and a half. So they have him go up to the, to the pond and all the cameras are in place and he throws the rock, and of course he doesn't have the strength for it to go into the water. So they do a second take, and it doesn't go into the water. And they do a third take, and they couldn't make him go closer to the lake because all the lighting were in order. So it was Andy who needed to get this thing over, who gets a prop man to hide in a bush right in front of the thing. So they have Opie throw the stone, and then the, the, uh, the man who's hidden in the, bu the bushes, the prop man, he throws it so it'll plop. But if you don't believe me, just watch an episode of Andy Griffith. You will see a gravity-defying moment when he throws the rock. But if you count, you will see it falls in the water after it should have had it been released. And that is why. The other brilliant thing Andy Griffith did, it was Desi Lu, actually Desi Arnaz, Lucy's husband, who came up with the idea of filming the situation comedy I Love Lucy live with three cameras and a live audience because Lucy, Ricky, Ethel, and Fred got such brilliant performances with the chemistry with the audience. There's the audience laughing at Lucy, putting the chocolates in her mouth and everything. Andy decided not for the Andy Griffith show. No live audience, he said. And the reason, and it was a stroke of genius, he realized that there were a live audience. And with people like Barney and later Goober and Gomer, like Lucy, they're going to play to the audience, which is fine, except both character and plot were going to be sacrificed to the laughs they could get for the audience. Without a live audience, not only could they not play to these people, but have to actually be in character, but it allowed them to film the episode out of sequence. So if the first and last scene were in a graveyard, they could do it all together because there was no audience to get confused. And Andy was tight with a nickel, and this helped them make a huge profit right away. So they filmed it with no audience, but then, once it was done, they took it to a movie theater in Hollywood. They had, it was free for you to come in they had an audience watch the episode once it was filmed, and then they recorded the laughs that that audience gave, and they put that on the thing that went on television. So we're actually hearing a laugh track, but it was not laughers who would distract the actors. It was a wonderful, original thing to do. Talk about a perfectionist. He was up at 5.30 every morning, Andy Griffith. He was the first one there. He worked 16 hours a day. They filmed it for 40 weeks. There were 39 episodes every season. So for eight years, there are 249 separate episodes of the Andy Griffith Show. We talk about binge watching. If you would think, I think I'd like to binge watch the Andy Griffith Show from beginning to end, you would be dead long before you could sit through 239 30-minute hours. He was a perfectionist, smoked four packs of cigarettes a day. It's amazing. He made it into his 80s, drank coffee like there was no tomorrow. Even little Ronnie Howard, he made sure that he was on target as an actor and other ways too. He's only six and seven years old when it started, but about two years into the show, one day, they were going over the lines, and he said to Andy Griffith, he said, I'm not sure a kid would say that this way. And Andy said, well, how would a kid say it? And he'd done this many times before, and he tells him, and so Andy Griffith says, well, let's film it that way. And they do. And after it's filmed, Ron Howard, as an eight-year-old, is walking around very proud and proud of himself. And Andy Griffith says, what's the matter, young'un? 
And little Ron Howard looks up and says, that's the first suggestion of mine you've ever taken. And Andy Griffith said to him, well, that's the first one that was any damn good. Get a little better taste and you'll be in more shows. <laughs> Andy Griffith realized he was not a comic genius. He once said, it's sort of easy to get too much of me real quick. And so he is not a central character in the show. He's a central player, but he's not a character. Other shows named for the people, the Danny Thomas show, Danny Thomas is a character. The Mary Tyler Moore show, she's the character. Oh, Mr. Grant crying, all that sort of thing. Not Andy Griffith. Here's what he said he wanted from the Andy Griffith show. I want it to be a family show with a border of insanity around it. What's the border? Barney Fife, The Darlings, Gomer, Goober, Otis, Ernest T. Bass. It is a comedy with wild characters, but they're all put in place with Andy. He doesn't put them in their place, but by being such a straight arrow. In the first season, if you watch it, Andy Griffith has this big smile on his face. And he looks like a country bumpkin. Starting in season two, no big smile. He is the wise father and the great counselor for Barney and everybody else, and that's what makes the show work. It's the first Southern comedy as well. Is it like the other Southern comedies that came on within the next four years? You decide. The other ones? Hee Haw, Green Acres, Beverly Hillbillies, and Petticoat Junction. It's the one with dignity. It's the first one to show Southerners like they really are and not the butt of cheap jokes. Well, here we are. We're in 1969. Andy Griffith being born in 26, he's not even 40 years, he's just a little over 40 years old. There's so much more to say about his life, but I'm not going to say it. We're going to stop him right now at the end of the run of The Andy Griffith Show. The reason, here's the reason. The Andy Griffith Show went off and then, wow, was he offered television shows, one after another, and he took them all. Maybe you remember them. The Headmaster, Adams of Eagle Lake, The New Andy Griffith Show, The Newer Andy Griffith Show, <laughs> Salvage, The Yeagers. They were all absolute duds. And then, he comes down with Guillain-Barre disease, which paralyzed him from his hips down. He recovered from it, but for months he didn't think he'd ever be able to walk again. It was during this time when they filmed the first, the pilot, for Matlock, which is the one exception to what he would do that might live. Matlock is a good show. It is an Andy Griffith show but it is not the Andy Griffith show. By the time of Matlock, he is not just the central character, he's a character. He's playing for the cameras. He's got all these cute little tricks. It's a good show, it's not a great show, it's not an immortal show, and there's not one of those shows that some minister would decide to use a Sunday sermon on. It is going downhill. Also, the things I'm not mentioning, two terribly bitter divorces, a son named Sam who died at 37 of alcoholism the week that he got out of jail for beating his pregnant wife. Andy would go through quadruple bypasses, three different, uh, quadruple bypasses, heart surgery three different times, and when he died on July 3rd, 2012, here's something I don't think I've ever heard of before, he was buried within four hours of his death. No embalming for Andy. The reason? In his will, he stipulated he must be in the ground less than five hours after he was declared dead because he knew the National Enquirer and other magazines would be hanging out in Mantio trying to get that shot that they paid $10,000 for of some celebrity either dead or on his deathbed. 
I mention this because he was plagued for the last half of his life by the sleazy paparazzi that would not leave him alone anywhere. Celebrity he wore pretty well, but it wore him down. When he would go to the hardware store in Mantio, first there'd be two people behind him, then there'd be eight people behind him, then there'd be 12 people behind him, and they'd all be whispering, and he would turn around and simply say, yes, it is. <laughs> now, isn't it sad to go out and know that people want to know, is that really you? And it really was. But even though 50 minutes are over, I'm not going to end on a depressing note on Andy Griffith. We are going to go back to the Andy Griffith show, smack dab in the middle of it in a 1963 episode. And I want to read you a little bit from the script so that you'll remember what makes it an immortal show. This is a show called Barney's New Car. Barney, for the first time, gets an actual car. Of course, it's a used car. He sees an ad in a newspaper, and it's from this little old lady who only drives the car to church every Sunday to pray for her dead husband. Well, she comes out and she says, you don't want to test drive it, do you? And Andy's begging him to test drive it because she kind of looks like this Ma Barker character who has a whole gang of stealing cars and then trying to sell it to boobs like Barney Five. But of course, Barney won't do that and you can guess what happens. But the bit I'm going to read you occurs in, in the episode Barney's New Car, but it has nothing to do with the plot at all. But it has everything to do with why we love this show. When they're waiting for this little old widow to go to church to find the deed for the car that she had left there, just to pass the time, Barney and Andy have a conversation, which they do all the time. This is the conversation. Barney talking about buying a car. This is about the biggest thing I've ever bought, Ange. Andy says, it's a major step, it is. Barney says, the last big thing I bought was for my mom and dad's anniversary present. Andy, what'd you get him? Barney, a septic tank. <laughs> Andy, for their anniversary? Barney, well, they're really hard to buy for. Besides, they were thrilled with it. Two tons of concrete, all steel reinforced. Andy says, you're a fine son, Barn. <laughs> Barney says, I try, Ange. I try. Now, in that little nugget is why we love the Andy Griffith Show. It's about people we care about. They amuse us, but they touch our hearts. There's almost no show on television. And you do need to know it won not one Emmy. None. Not for Andy Griffith. Not for the show. Five Emmys were won by Barney Five. Don Knotts took away five Emmys, but only him. Nothing for Andy, nothing for the show. The year it was up, every year it went up against the Dick Van Dyke Show, which cleared the decks of everything except Best Supporting Actor, because of course the Andy Griffith Show did have Don Knotts. But the point is now 50 years later, well the Dick Van Dyke Show was quite good, but you don't walk away with anything from the Dick Van Dyke show about writers in New Rochelle, New York. But the Andy Griffith show, as I said, is still being, sermons are being given about it, and it has something to do with the quality of our life that no other situation comedy has ever seemed to touch. Mm -hmm.